Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, just a couple uh, announcements. So homework number four, uh, you have, well, first of all, you have a homework that's due today that's homework number three. Homework number four, I was going to pass out to you today, uh, but decided not to make the copies because I got to pass these out, which is your lab. So for your homework number four, just get that off of the website. And I think, because uh, I don't want to carry this here, and I'm not sure that you guys are really collecting all of them. Maybe I won't be passing out too many of these things anymore in class, and I'll just let you access it off the web. That might be the easier thing for me to do, actually. And it's all up on the web anyway, so maybe this is the last time I'll pass one of these things out. And I won't do it till a little bit more so that everyone can be in the class. Um, what other things? Oh, the overhead lights. Um, all right, a couple other things that I should take care of here, and that is that uh, we have a holiday coming up on Monday uh, next week. And so there's been some questions as to what should be done for the labs. And so here's what we're going to do for the labs. Let me just add this here. So labs on Monday, or the lab on Monday, just shift to next Monday. Okay, so if you have a Monday lab, you're not doing lab on Monday because it is a holiday, but you will be shifted to next Monday. Now you may think that that puts you a week behind, but not really. Right, because the labs last throughout the week. You're just now at the tail end of that group of labs for that particular week. Okay? So that's what we'll do about that holiday that's coming up. Um, any questions about anything before I start into lecture? Yes. The labs are due during the lab section for next week, I suppose. So if you have a Monday lab, se I guess you get an extra week to turn in your lab <laughs> just because you're on Monday. Yeah. Oh, Travis said turn it in on Tuesday? Yeah, that's fairer, actually. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's just go with what Travis said. That is fairer, actually. You could turn it in on Tuesday. But then you'd have to find your, I, I guess he's saying turn it into the box on Tuesday. OK. Why didn't he say turn it in the box on Monday? Oh, okay, can't get into the building. That's a good reason. All right. All right. Okay, sure you can. You all have access. We won't change that on you. We'll just do it Tuesday because who knows what you're doing on Monday, right? It's your holiday. Um, so I guess what I'll do right now is, since we're a little deeper into the class, pass out lab number two, which is also online. You can see it's a much thicker lab. So there's a lot more work involved with it. And if you look on your syllabus, I'll start some of them here and then start some of them. I should go all the way in the back, shouldn't I? And there's only one person all the way in the back here. <laughs> Unless, is there someone here? Well, whoever that is is getting one too. OK. Yeah, there's more work on this. There's multiple parts to this lab. And so when you show up to lab section next week, your TAs will talk to you about this. But this is actually a hardware lab where you're going to put together some op amps, which we'll be discussing fairly soon here in lecture. But this lab lasts a number of weeks. And you can see each of the parts there is meant to be about a week per part. All right? And so you're putting together this actually in hardware. You're going to have to have a breadboard, et cetera. And you will actually be measuring parts of this uh, op amp as well, then turning in a report at the very end of this. Uh, you know, you have real parts, so at the end of this, you can see actual data sheets there. Again, this is going to be online, so if you don't get one of these in lecture today, you can always just download this and print it out from online. Yes? Yeah, so you will not start your lab two until the week after next week, okay? And so you will turn yours in exactly 
the number of weeks that every, you'll have exactly the same time that everyone else has to, to get your labs done. Okay? Any other questions, logistics? All right. Um, so I will be in town, of course. I was not in town yesterday. That's why I was not in office hours. Uh, but it looks like I'm going to miss yet another Monday office hour <laughs> next week. I haven't made a single Monday office hours, I think, for this whole semester. But that's OK, because some of my peers, right, they only have one office hour. Some of them do, right? I actually have two. I just haven't been able to take advantage of the second one. Um, all right. So today we're going to talk about a new topic, current sources. Uh, but we're going to do that after we talk about, uh, after we finish talking about this uh, actively loaded, uh, an, well, analysis of actively loaded the transistor circuits. And so we took a look at one of the more complicated ones last time. And the complexity you can see just by the analysis we had to do uh, to get not only the input resistance, the output resistance, uh, but also the frequency response. And you can see all the work that had to go into getting all of those different things. And frequency response especially was uh, kind of onerous here because we had to, of course, ca you know, re represent all the capacitors, determine all the driving point resistances associated with these capacitors, and then calculate the time constants, which then yields this expression for the dominant pole. Okay, and all this work that we've done we're basically getting the dominant pole of this amplifier. But as we talked about a little earlier in the semester, this does a pretty accurate job of getting the dominant pole. This is, again, called open circuit time constant analysis. And I guess what we determined was V naught over uh, V sub S. And if I made a dB plot, of that ampli amplitude here, then I would look at something like this, and it would have this pole right there, which is a dominant pole, which means there's going to be a lot of space between this pole here, which is omega h that I've called right there, which I think I'll also call omega p1. There's going to be a lot of space between that dominant pole and your second pole which occurs out here. So we talked about the fact that th there usually isn't just one pole. You also have a second pole. You might have a third pole, et cetera, so on and so forth. And this open circuit time constant analysis is great because we got the dominant pole. And that's a pretty accurate value for the dominant pole. Is it exact? It actually isn't exact because it's including more information than it should have. Um, and so this is the last thing that I wrote last time. All of this, of course, we did last time. But the last thing I wrote, is this accurate enough? And can we be a bit smarter about this? And the, the answer to that is yes, we can be a little bit smarter about this. Okay. And so how is that? Well, if we look at this whole thing, and I guess maybe I should draw that over again, at least some of it over again. Let me do that. So if we just take a look at the bottom section of this circuit, where most of the action is occurring, right? The top section is basically the load. It's a cascode load. So if I go back here and look at this, this top section, which is M3 and M4, that's a load. That's presenting a big resistance to you that you then multiply by GM to get the gain of this whole thing. The bottom portion also presents a big resistance too. So it's the parallel combination of the bottom portion resistance, top portion resistance times GM gives you the gain of this. Because those resistances are enormous, you can get a lot of gain in a single stage when you stack transistors the way that you're looking at right here. Okay, the other thing that you saw, at least in the frequency response, is that you help yourself in some way uh, to, say, suppress the Miller effect in this case. So we had this capacitor. Well, there was a capacitor, CGD, that went from this node 1 to node 2. But we, using the Miller effect, turned that into two capacitors. But the size of those two capacitors was not that big. right? And the reason why they weren't that big is because the gain from this point 1 to this point 2 was very small. It was equal to only minus 1. Okay, and so that was key to maintaining good frequency response, at least for this section of the circuit. Okay, but then we run into this section of the circuit, where now you've got an enormous resistance at the output. 
you have a certain size capacitance at the output too. And with that large resistance and that capacitor there, that ends up creating your dominant pole. Okay? And we took this time constant, which dominated, plus that time constant at node 2, plus the time constant at node 1. And that's how we arrived at omega h. But in fact, that's not completely precise. And so again, remember, this open circuit time constant analysis is an approximation. So there's my RS going into a device M1. There's device M2. I won't show the top portion, but I will show the output that we're taking, V0 there. And we had labeled these nodes. Uh, this was node 1 right here. That was node 2. And that was node 3. And so what can you notice about all of this? Well, one thing you can notice is that you have capacitors. And there's certainly a capacitor that was loading this output node right there. And I'm not, I'm not going to label these capacitors anymore. You certainly had capacitors that were loading all of the nodes. So this basically was grounded here. And I had another capacitor, of course, that went from here to here. I had Miller capacitance, some amount of capacitance there, and then some amount of capacitance there. And that's what we did. Uh, that's what we used to calculate all those time constants. Okay, but what I want to do is take a look at this circuit and see if we can be smarter about this. So if we look at the, the first part of the circuit, I've got a stage that's going from node 1 to node 2. Okay. Now, usually what you have to worry about is that that doesn't really only go till node 2. Right? When we determine impedances at a particular node, we usually have to go all the way out. Like in this case, if I had a bipolar circuit like this, And I wanted to determine, well, let's put a resistor there to make it simpler. And I wanted to determine the impedance seen looking this way, right? Then I'm not only going to see the R pi of this transistor, but I'm also going to see this RE in parallel with the R pi of this transistor if that's Q2, right? This is Q1. Okay, so I get R pi 1 plus beta plus 1 times RE in parallel with the R pi of 2. And if I wanted to, I could put that in parallel with the R naught of 1. Right? So what's happening is that the resistance or the impedance from the next stage is affecting the first stage. Okay? That's what you get if you have something like this. So this impedance. is affected by the next stage. And that would be true as well if you have capacitors out here. Okay, So for example, you also, in addition to this, have a capacitor right here. There's a C pi 2 somewhere out there. There's other capacitors there. But just taking this as an example, right? if R pi 2 of Q2 affects the impedance I see looking in from that end, so does C pi 2 okay? in a high frequency response. Right, so this is a circuit where I can't really separate out these two stages. Right? I can't just call this a stage one and a stage two, where they have separate transfer functions because they actually interact with each other. Right? I, I'm not going to be able to do this. Okay, but there are some circuits where you are able to do this kind of separation. Okay, and that is this circuit up above. So in your cascode circuit, you can kind of see this kind of separation. Okay, so take a look at this closely. I have a capacitor at the output right here. Okay, say I was looking at stage, uh, the, the stage between nodes one and two. So I'll draw that same thing again. Say I'll call that stage one here, and then call this stage two. And stage one is defined by everything between node one and node two, and stage two between node two and node three. Okay, But if I look at stage one, 
and I look at the output of the stage one, what is the output impedance of stage one? What impedance is it looking into? Yes. Not, no, not, yeah, that's not what I mean. I'm saying the impedance looking up this way. So if I were to take the impedance looking up in this direction, I'm seeing basically a 1 over gm, right, of 2 plus gmb of 2, and nothing more, right? I'm seeing this impedance from that point really to this ground right here. I'm not really seeing the effect of this capacitor. So in a way, I could say that stage one is fairly well isolated from stage two, right? So if I wanted to calculate the total gain of this circuit or the total frequency of this response of this circuit, I could say that, OK, I've got two circuits here. I've got a stage one right here, which is not affected by the stage two. And so I can separate it, and then I have a stage two. Okay, And stage one, then, is going to have a Transfer function is going to be something like whatever its gain is. I call that A1 times 1 plus S over its pole. That's its transfer function. And for the second stage, which I've now shown is isolated from stage 1, that's got its own gain. So there's the A2, 1 plus S over omega P2. And just like you did in 20N, or your signal processing course, to get the total transfer function of this, I'm just going to multiply those two together. Okay? But what this is telling, and that does give you the total transfer function, but what's really important about this, we've isolated the poles. Okay? This is one of my poles, which I've actually labeled wrong here. Now I know, because if I want to call omega P1, well, let me, who cares about my labeling here? This pole here, Right, which is the lowest, it's, it's the largest time constant, so the lowest frequency. This is what my real omega h is. And when we added this stuff, the time constants from this to omega h, we were adding superfluous stuff that made our answer a little bit incorrect, actually, but not much incorrect since this pole was so much larger than that by virtue of the dominant pole approximation. So looking at it this way. I can separate the transfer functions. So let me write that. Can separate the transfer functions. And I can say now, so 1, that node 3, which is associated with stage 2, uh, contributes the dominant pole. And so that would be omega p I guess I'll still call it omega p2 in this case because I did at the top for to keep the stages the same but usually you'll call that omega p1 but that'll be 1 over tau at 3 Let me make sure that 3 shows up well Okay so that's our dominant pole and then I can say that the capacitors associated with nodes 2 and 3 or sorry with 1 and 2 contribute the second pole so i could say that omega p1 which is the second pole is 1 over tau 1 plus tau 2. Okay, So just by a little bit of understanding of this circuit, I have figured out you know, two of my poles. And so now I have figured out this transfer function back here, which I guess I'll, let's call that omega p2 and that omega p1, just because that's what we've been doing in the analysis to follow. Okay? So everyone see that? This is a simpler case. We'll be able to see more cases like this in more complicated circuits, but generally what you're looking for 
is this. You're looking for some way where you can separate out these stages. Okay, these stages could not be separated out because this capacitor from stage two affects what's happening in stage one. You cannot pull those apart and separate them, isolate them completely. But if you figure out, a, if you could see that they're isolated completely, and often that happens when you have this type of thing. You have followers. You have very low impedance loads on certain things. If you can find those, you can separate out the poles. And well, you can separate out the capacitors and say these capacitors contribute one pole, these capacitors contribute the other pole, and one of them will probably be dominant. Okay, this is your first instance of this. We'll get a lot more practice at this when we start doing full-fledged op-amps. Uh, but just keep in mind, right? you've learned open circuit time constant analysis. That's great. You can calculate time constants. You can get the dominant pole, but that's not the end of it. Because by the time we're done with this class, this second pole will be at least as important as the dominant pole, especially for stability issues, and maybe more important. Okay. All right, so that's what I want to end up with here, at least in our discussion right now, of actively loaded transistors and how to analyze them and their frequency response. Is that a question back there? Or? Okay. Um, so it's some type of frequency, but maybe it Yeah, but the tau's are not, though. Tau is not the same as T, necessarily. So, yeah, so it ends up being radians, and you have to do the 2 pi conversion for that, yeah. Yes? So we can only separate when the impedances of the next stage don't affect? Yeah. Okay. yeah well, I mean, there's, there's all, I mean, this is one example of how one stage affects the other. This is just an example of impedance due to capacitance or so. There could be other effects, like linearity and stuff that go beyond the scope of this class. But at least for this instance, you're looking for these impedance changes. Yes? Oh, for this? No, you can in BJT, too. Yeah, absolutely the same thing. So, so in BJT, you could also have a 1 over GM looking up that way, right? You could have a stack of two transistors here. You get the same kind of effect. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter the technology. Uh, it's just what's loading what. Okay. Yeah, this is the cool part of the circuit design here. What I've taught you so far was the mechanical part where you just follow a procedure. The cool part is coming up now where you have to have some experience looking at the circuit and being able to determine what can be separated, what can't. Okay? Uh, but now we're going to leave that cool part because we need to go to some other things. We'll, go, we'll come back to it when we get to more complicated circuits here. But right now what I want to do is talk about current sources, which are next is our next uh, topic after we've just talked about active loads. And for current sources, this is something you have seen before. So I am going to go through this initial part fairly quickly, parts that I believe are reviewed to you. And this will all be on the web for you. So there's no way you're going to be able to copy all this down um, while I'm going through it, because I'm going at light speed right now. But this will be on the web for you. But this is all review for you, OK? At least I think it, it is, and it should be. Uh, so, how do you implement a current source? So we talked about the fact that these active loads we're talking about, they're approximating current sources. Because what's one thing you want out of a current source? Well, an ideal current source looks like this. It's just that current source symbol there. And that current source symbol does really just one thing. It shoves a current into a node, right? And it does it ideally because nothing can stop it, right? Nothing can stop it because it has no resistance associated with it. So in other words, that current will go through there, and it's going to go through there no matter what. If I wanted, now, of course, current sources are not super strong, right? They, they can be stopped. And they can be stopped if they're trying to drive an impedance, for example, that's too large. Right? You can't send current into an infinite impedance. And so the way that that's modeled is to put an impedance in parallel with the current source that represents the current source impedance. So for example, if I wanted to drive current into the short, all of the current will go into the short. None of it will go into R0. But if I wanted to drive the current into some resistance here instead of that short, say I drove it into this, where the load resistance was finite and maybe even big, then you can say some of that current, some fraction of I0, say I0 prime goes into that, but the other fraction, I0 double prime, will go into that resistance. So you're not getting all of your current 
into your load, which is what your current source is supposed to do. Okay? You can get a lot of your current, though, into that load if R0 is big. Okay? So this current I0 is maxed, okay, which means good. when R0 is big, OK? So an ideal current source is one that has an associated impedance, R0, that's either big or that is infinite. Infinite is ideal. Good is very large R0. Okay, so how do we implement something that has a very large R0? Well, we kind of know how to do that with transistors. This is kind of what some transistors are made for in the active domain here. And that is, say we take just a bipolar transistor like this, if we put a constant bias on its gate uh, and we bias this up with some DC collector current I sub C, then we know that the output resistance can be very large here. I think I have a plot of that somewhere here. Well, I've got a plot of that somewhere in these notes here, but apparently not so soon here. But we know this is going to have a very large output resistance. And that, again, is something that we want. So that's specifically something that we'd like to have. And so I'll just draw that in here. Right? In the end, this R0, we know if, whether it's a bipolar transistor or whether it is a MOS transistor, that R0 is going to be enormous. Bipolar is going to be 100K, 200K. MOS could be even larger than that, mega ohm or so. That makes for a great current source with a large resistance like that. But if you want to create a current source like this, uh, then you have a problem here. Because you want this current here, I sub C, to be specified very accurately. Okay, So you want that to be accurate. You want 1 milliamp. You don't necessarily, well, I mean, accurate to the point that we want to be accurate, which is not that accurate, right? So. 1 milliamp, 1.1 milliamp, 0.9 milliamp, OK, we accept that. Right, but we don't want it to be 2 milliamp or 3 milliamp or so if we were trying to hit around 1 milliamp. Okay, and so what does it take to get that current to be very accurate and very stable? It takes, one, a very stable V bias voltage. Okay, but it also takes a very specific V bias voltage in that this is an exponential response right here. Right? So I can't just stick a bias voltage on this uh, base of this transistor here. I have to stick a bias voltage that's 0 0.68745, right? Many significant digits there. I have to get a very accurate bias voltage, many significant digits, because when it goes through that exponential, just a change in one of these digits here is going to change that current by quite a bit. Okay, so I have to be very accurate about this bias voltage. And the question is, how can I be so accurate about this bias voltage? How can I specify that voltage so accurate, so accurately? Okay, that's the case for bipolar, but it's no different for MOS. In MOS, right, the output resistance of this current source, R0, is going to be equal to the little r0 here, which is also going to be large in that case. But I still have the same problem that I now have to specify that V bias. And that V bias has to not only be some constant voltage, but it has to be very, very accurate. So the question becomes, how do I generate such a V bias voltage that's both very stable and that's accurate to many significant <coughs> figures? Okay. Well, one way you might think of doing that, the easiest way to do it is, oh, OK, let's make a resistive divider. OK, so here's VDD. There's R1, there's R2, and there you go. There's my V bias. Okay, this is sort of what we did in the off-chip sense. Okay, but there's two problems with wanting to do this on, on the on-chip. Right, one, these resistors, like we saw last time, they're a little bit big. Right, we don't like things that are big on chip because area on your chip is money. And money is everything. Right? You have to save as much money as you possibly can to make the cheapest product you possibly can. Otherwise, your competitor will kill you on price. Okay? And unfortunately, transistors today are very much a commodity type thing. 
you know, everyone's trying to lowball everyone else in terms of price for the same performance. Um, the other th problem with this resistive divider here is how accurately can you get those resistors? Okay, so you know VDD. That's going to be specified fairly well. Right? That's going to be specified, say that's 1 volt, 1.1 volt or something, maybe 2 volts or so for an analog type process. But you know, it, it won't, might not always be 2 volts either, right? So if you're using your iPhone or so, and that's, that's working off of a battery, does that battery maintain the same voltage throughout the time that you're using that iPhone? No, it's actually changing a bit, right? And so your phone's designed to operate uh, on a changing voltage, whereas when the voltage <coughs> drops below a certain amount, it will no longer operate. Okay, so that voltage changes, first of all. And if that voltage is changing, if you're generating that voltage using this uh, voltage divider here, that V bias will change. And that means the current will change enormous amounts as the battery voltage changes. Okay, so you need to have some insensitivity to the supply. The other problem is in an integrated circuit process, you simply cannot specify R1 and R2 that accurately. Okay, you, you can't do it. Integrated circuits, you can match things well, but you cannot get specific values very well. Okay, and you can't even match things well enough for this case here. So resistive type biasing is not a good thing. We need another way to generate this V bias. And so that's what we're going to focus on now. We're going to focus on methods for generating that V bias, uh, which is the most important thing to do for a current source. Uh, and we're going to try to do it with a degree of precision uh, using a transistor circuit. So what's a good way to get precision? A good way is what's called replica biasing. Okay, replica biasing means you bias something up and then you just copy it. And when you copy it, it performs the same way as, as the original. Okay, and so that's what I'm showing right here. So the first thing in replica biasing, so you generate a current. Okay, a simple way to generate the current is just to send it, send it put a voltage across the resistor and send the current through that resistor. Okay, so say we do that and call that resistor our reference resistor. Okay, now I need to generate the actual bias voltage V bias. And if I'm going to use a transistor like this as my current source, then I might as well shove that current, I ref, push it through the transistor. And if I hook up my transistor in a diode connection like this, it will automatically bias up to the right VGS required to get this current ID1. Okay, so remember your current equations here. ID1 is equal to 1 half mu n C ox W over L times this quantity that includes VGS1. It includes VT and everything, but if you assume everything is constant, then this thing will settle to a very specific VGS, and that is my voltage. That's my magic voltage, right? That's the one that is accurate to many significant digits that supports a current equal to I ref. Okay? Now, you also have this term out here, but what can we say about this? Yeah, it's not going to affect us too much as long as lambda is a small value. Saying lambda is a small value is the same as saying you have a large output resistance. Okay, so this VDS1 that's going from the drain to the source of the transistor, yes, it is affecting the current, but it has such a small effect that it's not going to affect you enough to mess with your current source. Okay? And so, effectively, just by doing this, this VGS that's generated that automatically takes on the value necessary to support that current is now a voltage you can use, and that is your V bias. So effectively, what we've just created in this simple circuit here is a V-bias generator, otherwise known as a current mirror. Well, right now it's a V-bias generator. We haven't made the mirror just yet. Okay, and so what can you do with this? I just said it. You can go out and use this to create a simple MOS current source, which is a current mirror like this. And so I know you've seen this stuff before. I'm just really reminding you of the basic fundamentals, the principles behind all of this. So exactly what's being done. This part right here, that's just what I'll call our V-bias generator. All it's doing is generating that voltage V-bias, 
And then we're going to take that voltage V bias, and we're just going to hook it up to another transistor, uh, usually a transistor M2 that's identical to transistor M1. But it doesn't have to be, because I can actually change its W over L ratio. As long as it's ratioed to M1, then I'm going to get that much different current. So if I make W over L2 larger than W over L1 by two times, then I'm going to get twice the current I0 than I ref. Okay? And that's all captured in all of these expressions here. That, again, a diode-connected transistor in saturation, that generates the V bias voltage. If all things are the same between these two transistors, then if I have I ref going through ID1, if ID1 equals I ref, then ID2 is also going to be equal to I ref because they have the exact same gate voltage. They may have slightly different drain to source voltages, but they have the same gate voltage. So effectively, they have the same current. Okay. And so I've got the different cases down below this here. I've got case one where you match M1 and M2. That means the current flowing through M2 is the same as I ref. I've got case two where M1 and M2 are scaled relative to each other. Uh, and so that means I0 is equal to I ref times W over L2 divided by W over L1. And uh, in general, when you're doing on-chip design, you want to take advantage of matching as much as possible. So this, these Ls, uh, the uh, lengths of the channels of these transistors, uh, you generally choose them to be equal. So then in the end, what you're really doing is not ratioing W over Ls. You're just ratioing their Ws. So W2 over W1 becomes the ratio between I0 and I ref. Okay, I guess, okay, for better accuracy, you know, usually you're looking for exactly twice the current uh, in one branch as in a reference branch or so. And so to be as accurate as possible, what you do is you don't really draw W2 to be two times that of W1. You actually use two of them to make W2, okay? And so this reduces edge effects. So for example, in this case here, this is how I would double the current here. This, this is getting I0 equal to 2 times I ref, where I ref is this current. This is showing layout of transistors that you've seen a little bit earlier in this class, although some of you may not remember it well because you kind of have to take 143 to have a good memory of this here. But in these transistors, right, this is the gate. This is the source and drain there. And you see that in order to make the transistor that has two times W over L, what I'm doing is I'm just creating two transistors and putting them side by side. Okay, so why is it that I want to do this instead of just you know, doing one transistor with twice the width of this first transistor? Anyone know the reason? Yes. Yeah, that's. Exactly. Right. So what she's talking about is undercuts. Okay, so if I if I draw say a cross section of my gate here or say say I wanted to do etching. Say this is a mask right here that protects the bottom layer against etching. The way that we're forming layers, the way that we're patterning layers is we're etching them. So we would go down and attack this material here. Maybe it's an ion etch or some other chemical etch. But the attack is never absolutely straight down. You always get a little bit of undercut here. Okay. And if you get this kind of undercut in a single device, you get the same amount of undercut in a device with twice the width. But then you'll see that those ratios won't stay the same. Right? The ratios stay the same if I get the same undercut in both these devices as this device right here. Okay. So because of these undercuts, the way you want to lay out these MOS transistors for current sources is not one contiguous large width. You want many separate widths here. And that's how it's done in actual layout. Um, OK, and so this is just showing that a single V bias generator can serve numerous current sources. That's especially the case in MOS. Okay, so if we're looking at, say, CMOS right here, um, 
because the impedance at the gates of these transistors is infinite, we don't really have to worry about loading for every stage that we add to this. So here we generate this V bias voltage here, and we just distribute that to as many different stages as we like. Okay, in MOS, that's easy to do. In bipolar, it's a bit of a different story. Okay, so here's the equivalent bipolar circuit to everything we've been talking about in MOS so far. Right? This is a simple bipolar current mirror. Again, this part right here, we can easily identify as our V bias generator. And it's now supplying a V bias voltage right at that node to another stage Q2. In this case, though, because bipolar bases are, do not have infinite resistance, we now have to worry a little bit about the current that's stolen by each additional current source we add to this. So for example, I've got this nice IREF current flowing down here. And a lot of that IREF current goes and continues to flow through Q1 as IC1. But a small fraction of that current goes out this way and will go into the base of Q1 and into the base of Q2. And because beta is not infinite, I should take into account some of that current. And so in the next page, we are taking that into account. So right here, if we figure that according to KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law, VBE1 has to be equal to VBE2, which I've written right here. Okay? Uh, that means pretty much that IC1 has to be equal to IC2. Okay? They may be a little bit of different because of the early voltage across. You have different uh, collector to emitter voltages for these two transistors. There may be a slight difference, but in all, all in all, they're the same, IC1 and IC2. Okay? If I do KCL around this loop right here, uh, summing up all the current coming through there and you know, IREF and IC1, then I can write out that IREF equals IC1, which is the current going through Q1, plus the base currents of both 1 and 2. And I can write the base currents as IC for those devices divided by beta. So that becomes IC1 times 1 plus 2 over beta. Okay, And so IC1 equals IC2. Uh, equals I naught, which is your output current here, which is not exactly equal to I ref anymore. Right? It's, it's equal to 1 plus 2 over beta times I ref. And if beta is large, if beta is 100, then yeah, they're pretty much equal. Okay, so why am I even caring about this? Because beta is usually large, right? Beta is usually 100, at least 50 or so, making this number rather small. So I naught is about equal to I ref. Okay, I guess some additional things with this in bipolar, you know this is going to be a VBE on, which is generally 0.7 volts, 0.7 or 0.6 volts, depending on technology. Um, and this current, of course, is VCC minus this VBE on divided by RF. And the output resistance of this thing is just R0 of 2. Uh, so this is the output resistance right here. Okay, so those are just some asides, but the reason why I care about this beta is because, again, I'm not just going to use this V bias generator to bias up just one current source. Right? Why waste the area and create many of them? All I need is one of them. And so I'd like to take this V bias generator and just attach it to numerous current sources just like I did to MOS. The problem with this is, is that for every current source that I'm adding here, I have to add one more to this too. Okay? Because they're adding their own base currents in there. And if you do the same calculation that I just did above, you find out that for this situation where you have n uh, different circuits that you're trying to bias up with current sources, uh, you end up having I ref being equal to IC1 times 1 plus n over beta. And so I naught, each of these currents going through these transistor circuits here, ends up not really being equal to I ref if n is large. Because right? you could think if beta is 100, say you had 20 of these things, that's 20 over 100. So that becomes 1.2 in the denominator. Now, uh, I naught is not really equal to I ref. Okay? And so that can be a problem because a lot of times you want to design this such that you're going to set this I ref, and that I ref sets all these other currents. So how do you fix this problem? Well, one thing you can do is take into 
take advantage of the fact that you can get as large a beta as you want by just cascading transistors. And you sort of saw this in your homework when you had to do inspection analysis of that cascade of transistors. So it doesn't, didn't look like this. It looked like one transistor after the other. But that's what this is, right? This is one transistor after another here. And so our effective beta in this case becomes beta squared, right? If that was 100, that's 100 squared. So now you have a much larger beta. And so now you're not too worried about this equation here. We have I ref over 1 plus n over now. That's basically beta squared, OK? So in order to retain performance like what MOS can give you in bipolar, all you have to do is add this uh, additional transistor, which is sort of a buffer transistor for base current, uh, to attenuate base currents that then go into the bases of all these other transistor current sources. Okay, so just a nice trick in bipolar to add a buffer there to prevent loss of current through base currents. Um, and so that's great. Right? The, the, the equations change a little bit on the biasing since you have two transistors here. Right? I, I'm assuming you know how to do your DC biasing well, but if you have two transistors here, then that's one VBE. That's another VBE that you get across that, so that at this point here, that's two. I guess I should call them VBE on. So you get two VBE on there. So to get the current now, you have to take VCC minus two VBE on over the reference resistor. And in this case, I've written that out there for your reference current. Okay, So all easily analyzable by each of you. Um, but going on from here, oftentimes, you know, you actually would like to have a smaller output current than what your reference current is generating. So your reference current may generate the largest current that you need in your circuit, but then all the other currents are going to be smaller than that. And you want those currents to be small mainly because of power consumption, right? You, you all have phones now that you wish would last longer on a battery, but they're not lasting so long on a battery because this, that's about the best they can do. They do everything they can to lower the power consumption. And one thing you can do is for circuits that don't need as much current, lower that current. And so you can do that in a bipolar process, and this is uh, true of MOS, by just using a much smaller device, Q2, as your current source. So Q2 is the current source device in this, making it much smaller than your reference device. So in other words, you can make your reference device 10 times larger than Q2. And if you go ahead and do that, uh, you could sort of work out the circuits here um, that you can reduce your current here uh, by pretty much that amount there, by just ratioing those two devices. So if I make this 10 times larger, this current will be 10 times smaller. Okay, well, that's great, but what if you needed to go from, say, an I naught? Well, what if you needed an I naught of 5 microamperes here and you had a VCC of 30 volts? Uh, which is something you would find in a bipolar type circuit. You know, especially in military bipolar circuits, you'll have them up near 28 volts or something like that. Uh, but if you have something like that, then in order to generate this 5 microamperes, you need 600 kilo ohms of resistance to be this RF there. Okay. As we talked about, that's huge because that's going to take a lot of your area on your chip. Remember how you lay out resistors? Resistors are basically just snaking polysilicon lines. You have to just make them long enough to finally get the total resistance that you're looking for. Okay, so how do you get around that? Well, there's other solutions like a Widlar current source, where you basically just load the emitter of one of your transistors, well, of your current source with that resistor, R2. What that does is it splits this voltage VBE1. So your, your V bias generator is generating VBE1, which is V bias, except now you're not using that total V bias. You're, you're going to put some of that V bias, which is VBE2, across the base to emitter of the of device Q2, but then the rest of that voltage is going to be dropped across R2. Okay, so in that way, what you've done is you've reduced the VBE on Q2, which then allows you to reduce this I0 current relative to I ref. 
right? So how do the equations work out for this? Well, you can just brute force this thing using KVL again. So VBE1 is going to be equal to VBE2 plus this VR2 there. Uh, but VR2 is just really the emitter current of Q2 divided by or times R2. The emitter current is IC divided by alpha. Alpha is virtually 1, right? And so we're just going to say that that's IC times R2. So the equation I have is that VBE1 equals VBE2 plus IC times R2. And so now I can just do a little bit of rearrangement of this, put the VBEs on this side here. But I know what VBE is by just re rearranging the current equation from a bipolar transistor. VBE1 is VT times natural log IC1 over IS1. And similar equation for VBE2. You subtract two natural logs. It's like dividing their arguments uh, with a natural log. So you end up with IC2 times, RT times R2 equals VT times natural log IC1 divided by IC2. And then finally, plugging in uh, the fact that IC1 is equal to I ref, that says this equation right here. So now you have an I naught. It has to be solved uh, using your calculator here. It's not a linear equation here. Either use your calculator or use uh, you know, different uh, techniques like iteration techniques or so. Uh, but you end up seeing that uh, as a rule of thumb, if you drop 18 millivolts across that resistor there, you're going to knock your output current relative to I ref down by two times. And 42, 60, 120, so on and so forth, you get one fifth, one tenth, one hundredth. So you don't have to make big changes here. You don't have to make big device sizes, device size changes. You don't have to have huge resistors or so to get some very, very small output currents relative to your reference current if you use a Widlar current source like this. And I guess I've got an example right here uh, that's saying if you want to scale the current by 100 times using a Widlar source, then choose the voltage drop to be 120 millivolts. And in this case, R2 becomes 120 divided by 5 microamps. Uh, that becomes 24 kilo ohms. So you need a 24 kilo ohm R2 right here uh, with an R reference of 60 kilo ohms, which is still kind of big, but at least it's not 600 kilo ohms, right? And at least it's, it's only one resistor, right? That's why you only want one V bias generator because you don't want to put that many resistors on your chip because they take up space. Okay. Uh, the other advantage of the Widlar current source is, right, as you know, if you do inspection analysis of this thing straight from the top, if I want to get my output resistance, that's just going to be R0 of 2 times 1 plus GM times the emitter resistor in this case, which is R2. So you get a much larger output resistance, which means more ideal current source. Okay, so this is larger and some more ideal current source on that side. Okay, so all right, so I think that's all I want to say ab about things that I think you already know, right? So how much of that did you actually already know? All of it, including the Widlar? Oh, you've never seen the Widlar before, but that's the only new thing you've seen, right? All the rest of the stuff you knew. Okay, that's good. That's what I wanted. Um, so let me slow down now and talk about where current source design really becomes important. Okay, so, so far I've described current sources as just delivering a current to your circuit. But there's actually a lot more to the design of these things. And they actually end up being some of the more important things to design when you're trying to do something like an RF circuit. Like for the front end of your cell phones or so, you have to worry about a lot of things. And one of the bigger things you have to worry about is linearity. Okay, so in order to process certain modulated signals, in order just to transmit them, you have to guarantee that your circuits are linear enough to do that, that they reproduce whatever's at the input gets very faithfully reproduced at the output. So what's the definition of linearity versus nonlinearity? Can someone give me a very simple, well, I mean, you know the mathematical definition. Or actually, maybe you don't. How do I mathematically represent a nonlinear system versus a linear one? Actually, you do. It's simple. You just, there's, there's squared terms and cubic terms, right? So in a linear system, it's just k times x. In a nonlinear system, it's k times x plus l times x squared, et cetera, right? 
But what happens to a signal that's originally linear and then gets amplified by a nonlinear circuit? Can anyone tell me? What does nonlinearity do? What's that? Changes the frequency. It doesn't really change your fundamental frequency, but it does. You're right to some extent. It introduces frequencies that weren't there in the first place. So what nonlinearity does, it introduces things to the signal. And sometimes you want that introduced, right? So if, if there's anyone here that likes rock music or so, you live by introducing things that weren't there in the beginning, right? You distort the signal, and that's where distorted guitar, for example, comes from, or distorted anything, right? You're adding signals that weren't there in the first place. Okay, but in communications, you want the opposite to that. Because when you start adding signals, you start getting what's called distortion. And so you all have heard distortion before, right? On your cell phone, you can barely hear your friend speaking, and it doesn't sound good. On a cell phone, usually if you're trying to listen to music that someone's playing at the other end. I mean, your cell phone can certainly play music very well if the music is coming from inside the cell phone itself, inside its MP3 player. But if you were talking to someone who was trying to, say, let you hear a concert they were at, it wouldn't sound very good. Right? That's because cell phones are not linear enough. Okay, so what does it take to become linear? Uh, well, it has a lot to do with what's called headroom and output swing. Okay, so the issue we want to talk about now is output swing or headroom. I'm having a very difficult time writing today for some reason. It looks much worse than usual, right? All right, so how do I define headroom? So let's take a simple circuit. And in this case, we'll take our MOS common source amplifier. Maybe the simplest thing we can talk about. Uh, whoops. Let's change this a bit here, just to give you some experience with something a bit different. Let's make it a, a PMOS input. Okay, so there's my input voltage. There's VDD. This is V naught, and now this is going to be some V bias voltage here. Okay, so what I'm interested in here is how big my output voltage can get. Okay, and why am I interested in that? It's because usually in a, a high fidelity system, you're interested in two things. You're interested in, in how much noise you have in that system, and you're interested in how much, how large your signal is with respect to that noise. Because if that signal is larger than that noise, you're at least going to be able to decipher what's being said. But if it's not that much larger than that noise, it's going to sound distorted and noisy to you. You're going to hear a lot of shh in the back of whatever someone is trying to say to you. Okay, but if it is much larger than that noise, it's going to sound great. Uh, that's the difference between a good phone, a bad phone, and difference between a high fidelity stereo system and, and a phone. Okay? And so it all has to do, assuming that noise is going to be at a certain level, okay, and there will be classes where you learn about noise in great detail. So 240, I think 142 talks about noise. It's a very important concept, but it's not something that we don't have time to cover in a course like 140. But in 140, we can at least cover the other side of that. right? If you assume there's a certain amount of noise, then the best way to get around that is to make your output signal as big as possible. Okay? And so the question becomes, how big can we make our output signal? And so with this circuit here, let me just draw its output. Maybe it looks something like there, this. This is T. There's my output voltage. So what is the largest output that I can put out of this circuit, and what is the smallest output that I can get to in this circuit? OK, so let's, let's try looking at this here. So say I have, well, let, let's first take a look at what's the minimum voltage at this point. OK, so the minimum voltage in this circuit say this is where it's biased up here, and say this is capital V naught. 
And so this output I'll say is capital V naught plus that little v naught. That's the total signal. Okay? And that O is supposed to be a capital O. So I'll do that. Okay, so capital O, right? So this represents my total signal there, right? And so there's my capital V naught here. Okay, and I know I'm going to have a sinusoid over this thing here that's going to look something like this. But there, say this is my maximum sinusoid. Okay, this is my maximum linear sinusoid. And my question is, there's going to be some minimum voltage, V naught prime, that if I go below that voltage, this curve will no longer be linear. Okay, so what is this minimum voltage? Okay, and what I mean by that, the smallest V naught prime for which my bottom transistor, which I'll call M1, I'll call the top one M2 as usual, for which M1 still behaves as a good current source. Okay, so that kind of defines linearity for me, right? Linearity means that uh, everything is staying the same as my signal gets bigger, but once it passes a certain, thre certain threshold, suddenly everything changes. The gain of my system changes, and so when I get past that, I'm no longer getting a nice sinusoidal signal, but it starts flattening out, turning into a square wave, okay? And so you know what happens here. If I try to increase this thing here, so if I try to increase the size of this thing, then say on the top range it keeps going linear there, but at the bottom range it's got nowhere to go, right? It can't go below ground. So what it does is it starts flattening out like that and then comes back up there to linear. So it comes back up here to something linear, but then when it gets down here it starts flattening out again, right? And so this flattening out that's my nonlinear nonlinearity. That's what I want to avoid here. Okay? And so what's the minimum voltage that I can get to? The smallest V naught prime for which M1 still behaves as a good current source. Because that's what it is right there. And so Good current source, I said already, means that your output resistance of the current source is large. So if I call this R0 right here, that's a large number. And in order for that output resistance to be large, basically I need M1 to be saturated. Right? Because when I look at the transfer function from an MOS transistor, so say I were to plot that transfer function, what does that look like? So I'm just plotting ID1 here versus VDS, which in this case is the same as V0. Okay? But we know that that's going to look something like this. I'll have a linear region for the transistor and then a saturated region where the slopes change in a big way. And I can separate these two here. So this region here is saturation. This is the linear region. And there's two things I know about the performance of this device in these two regions. In the linear region, I get pretty much a linear line right there where the slope of the ID versus VDS curve is large, okay? And if the slope of the ID versus VDS curve is large, then that means R0 in this regime is small, okay? This is the regime we want to avoid.
So I'm recognizing now that what I've been what I'm saying is kind of confusing a bit. I started talking about linearity. We want to be linear. <laughs> and then I'm talking about the linear region for an MOS transistor. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't call it the linear. It's also called the triode region. <laughs> So maybe I should just call this the triode region here, right? In this case, we want to avoid operating in the linear region because the much better region to operate at is the saturation region, right? In the saturation region, the slope is 1 over R0, okay, which is tiny, right? R0 is huge. And so that slope is tiny. That's where we want to be. We want to stay in this saturation region. Okay? And so what decides whether we're in saturation or not for an MOS transistor from your knowledge of MOS transistors, device physics? It's, yeah, it's the voltage that I'm dropping from the drain to the source of this device here. I want to make sure I'm in this region here. And what is that point right here usually? at least for long channel devices? Yes, that's our, my VGS minus VT, which you're going to see because it's such an important quantity now in circuits, uh, you're going to see it now being given a number of different names. And in your book, in many books, it's now called VOV, which is the overdrive voltage. This kind of makes sense. It's overdrive because right to turn the transistor on, you really just have to be over VT. Right? If you're over VT, then the amount that you're over VT is uh, sort of an overage, an overvoltage. Okay? So we've defined right here this overdrive voltage here. It's called a number of other things too. So let me make sure that I cover all the things that it's called because you're, you'll see it called all of these things. Let's do that and go to the next page here. So a lot of times in physics, it's called VD sat okay, for a saturation voltage. And if you take courses like 231, maybe even in 130 it's covered now. Even in 130 you cover short channel. 130 covers short channel. OK. Yeah, so in 130 if you take that, you'll see short channel effects. And you'll see this VD sat actually is not just VGS minus VT. It's, it's actually more complicated than that, depending on how short your channel is, how thick your gate oxide is doping levels in your substrate. Pretty complicated thing. You spend a lot of time learning that. It looks like if you take 130 now, it used to be 231 had all that stuff, but 130's got it. So I would suggest taking 130 because if you really want to understand this stuff, that course will teach you a lot about how these de devices really work. In this course, though, we don't, well, we care, but we don't care as much, right, because we're more interested in ways to, to work with circuits. So here, we're usually assuming long channel devices, at least for our hand calculations. And so in this case, this will be VGS1 uh, minus VT of 1, I suppose, since we're talking about this device M1 right here as our current source. right? Uh, we'll also call this uh, VOV, which is our, stands for overdrive voltage. You'll even see people calling it in some textbooks delta V. So if you have an older edition of Gray and Meyer, they're calling it delta V. And there are even some people who call it VOD for overdrive. Okay. Uh, in most of my lectures, I'm just going to be using this, right? Because that's what your book is using right now. Yes. Yeah, so I'm trying to capture it actually in this picture right here. So see the red curve here? When that red curve gets big enough, once you hit this point here, and so that's what this point's going to be. If, if this point is the point where you, you're now out of saturation for that transistor, the, the VDS of the transistor is so small, you're no longer in saturation. So what happens is suddenly you go from this curve, where you have a very large R0, and so your gain here equals GM times R0, or it's about equal to that. So suddenly your gain is about equal to GM times
times whatever that resistance is, R0 prime. And now R0 prime is small. So suddenly you had a gain. Well, while you were still above this line here, you had a gain that was large. And once you pass that line, suddenly it's small so that it no longer amplifies this very fast. Right? And so now it, the curve looks very nonlinear. And so I guess I, I just wrote some of that down. But let me write some of this out here. And so to really look at this, you, you can write down your expression for current. Yes. VDS, when VDS is larger than VT, can you also be in saturation even when what? VGS is smaller than VT. VG, if VGS is smaller than VT, then your device is off, right? You'll be, yeah, so you have to keep the device on. Well, you can actually operate, that's weak inversion. So you can actually do that. But now the device behaves much more like a bipolar device. That's beyond the scope of this class. It's probably even beyond the scope of 130. I'm thinking, right? And so to talk about weak inversion circuits, uh, who talks about weak inversion circuits? 142, anyone talk about them here? For very low power stuff, you might want to work in what's called weak inversion, where you actually bias your gate below the threshold voltage. The device is still kind of on. And it actually operates like a bipolar transistor, uh, but it, 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 it's terrible, right? I'll even say it sucks, right? But it's good enough for audio applications, right? For cell phones, we're in the gigahertz range. You, you can't hear past, uh, depending on how dog-like you are, 20 kilohertz or something like that, right? And so that's a very low frequency. It turns out weak inversion circuits can handle that type of stuff. So if you want very low power stuff in, in the audio range, and you don't care that much about linearity because they're not very linear either, then weak inversion is a, is a viable way to go. But you're talking about weak inversion, and yeah. It, Everything's out the door in that case. Um, OK, so ID, the equation is 1 half mu n c ox, right, times W over L, times our VGS1 minus VT squared. OK, and so using this equation, I can then derive an expression for this VD sat. OK, so VD sat, which is also called delta V, also called V overage, uh, is then equal to uh, VGS minus VT, which just turning this equation around becomes square root of 2 times ID divided by mu n C ox times W over L. OK, this is going to be an important equation for you because you're going to have to derive very often, this V overdrive. Um, and so in the end, you can write this as VGS is equal to VT plus this V overdrive voltage. Okay. Now, the expression that I just wrote here, I'll just put some disclaimers here. This is for long channel devices, which we're assuming throughout this class. And generally, in the analog case, you're careful, you're careful to try to keep your devices on the long channel side. Um, I guess I'll just say for short channel, it's different. But I won't go beyond that in case some of you guys are working with short channel devices and research or so at some point. Um, and so the minimum voltage that still keeps M1 uh, as a good current source in this case I can call V out min that's just my VD sat or my V overdrive okay and so for this circuit, what can I say? So I'm, I'm looking at this circuit now. 
So therefore, the output swing for the circuit we just looked at is V swing. And I guess I'm going to write down a peak to peak swing. So that PP stands for peak to peak. Is going to be equal to VDD okay, minus the VD sat of 1. Okay, so the VD sat of 1 minus, it can't go past the VD sat of 2 either. Okay, so minus VD sat of 2. And that then is going to be my total swing, which is VDD minus 2 times a V overdrive. And that's what I can write now for my output voltage swing. And that's a very important parameter because, again, that determines the signal to noise ratio of any circuit I'm trying to build. Okay, that gives me the dynamic range. And when people talk about dynamic range, it's equal to the largest signal you can get divided by the noise floor of that particular circuit. And so in this class, you won't get all the information to get dynamic range, but you at least have half of it, which is this large signal here. Um, I should also put a qualifier on this here to say that uh, this is a curve that I'm drawing just for explanatory purposes. So assuming the upper part is linear, because as you can see, obviously it's not, right? The upper part cannot go as linear as that because it's going to run into VDD minus V overage as well, okay? All right, we will continue with this uh, in the next lecture. Don't forget to download your homework from the website. It's already up there. I just didn't pass it out today.